So, new lesson on random end settings for USD. So, what you see here is the land machine, the robot sprayer that I built uh, for the tutorial asset library that are shipped with this tutorial uh, series. And what I want to demonstrate is multiple things. First of all, every render operation in USD requires a light, otherwise you will not see anything. Your image will be black. I have placed a ground plane, it has a simple diffuse material. And what you also need is to use the RenderMan lob itself. This is the way to render an image, to set up some layers and so on. What we first have to check is if the right camera is in use. So actually we don't have any camera. And to do that, you create a new camera in, in the viewport. And the nice thing is when you create it in the viewport, it will actually move to the same position as your perspective before. So we will link it right in here. So we have a camera, it's, its name is camera one, and this is exactly what we have in here. Our output type is currently raster. This has an advantage. So when we want to render to M play and not to a image to disk, you have to keep the raster option active. When you already have used the Render man RIS, in that case, I already tested that. You see that that's the current situation. We currently have only the depth, the normal paths, and the ST paths, or the UV coordinates. And we want to use more output AOVs. So we go to Render man lob into image output. And here I will click through the menus. We have the normal path and 16 bit. I want to have the P path. This is qu quite nice for um, post depth and so on. And I will deactivate the V coordinate. Need that. We deactivate the beauty path. And I will al also activate the indirect diffuse as well as the indirect specular. So when we did that, we have to restart the render itself so that all the changes get updated in the scene. Of course, we have to choose this blue option right here. Otherwise, we are looking through the camera and not through the render operation. And here we have our direct path, our indirect or our direct specular, indirect diffuse, as well as indirect specular. And so far, so good. It looks really nice. The great thing about Render Man is you can change the render settings on a per object basis. It has a very big potential in saving render time and in optimizing your, your shot itself. So I already placed a render geometry settings right in here. I will activate it. And here I have changed the maximum diffuse and maximum specular depth, the bounces of this lighting on, on the object to two. And I will also copy and paste this to the ground. Lights should be rendered. Um, of course, I need to restart the image. And you see those changes currently have only a minor influence. And this is because of two reasons. We have to use the proper um, primitive path also for the ground. And that means we need to drag and drop the grid mesh right in here. And as you can see now, the entire influence of the indirect is gone. So, but as you can see, this is a heavy and nice way to influence your result. And of course, also your render times. 
So we will activate this again. And as you can see, all the stuff is back. So maybe we go back to four by four, four by four. So when we played with the IPR render and when we want to render uh, the image to disk, what we have to do is we have to change the output picture to the EXR format as well as change the output type raster to open EXR. And then of course you have to reset the render man RIS license. This is because I have only a single seed license and a single seed license will um, prevent the um, render man engine to render an image to disk because those are two uh, separate operations. Currently the IPR claims the render man license and I need to free them. So that's why I have clicked uh, the reset render man license button. And now I can render to disk in the background with the image settings that I have chosen. We can change more of those compression values right in here in display options itself, as well as we can add filters like tone mapping and as well as crypto mat and so on. This works right in here, crypto mat with the sample filter. Of course, we would have to change or need to change the, the path itself right in here. But for now, we don't need that. I will now move over to the Rust image again so that we can use the IPR. The IPR is bound to raster. So I have to store to save the file. Again, after each changes, you need to save the file. Otherwise, nothing will happen. It's saved. I will click render to disk and hopefully the image will now start to render on the screen. So I will forward this a bit. So back here we see um, it took about 15 seconds to start this process and there is something you have to keep in mind also when you render to disk or when you yeah when you render to disk either to the background or directly or to mplay renderman will use all the cores of your machine 100% i have currently 12 cores and yeah it's rendering quite fast when you use the ipr itself it will only use 50% of your cores so this is something you have to keep in mind. So the previews in the IP are always slower. This uh, provides additional performance for the entire interface. Otherwise, your interface, your Houdini, would be a lot slower and lagging. And that's because you have lesser cores in the IPR itself. So I will check all those layers again. It looks nice. And what we also can do is we can, of course, add motion blur or we can add different effects like the focus. And for the focusing, I will stop this render process right now. For the focusing, only what you have to do is you have to go to the camera settings itself to the sampling tab. It's already activated because it did in, in the presets. But if not, you set and create this, those values on the object. So we go to the camera tool and here we can activate the um, focus plane with shift F and now you see this line is our focus line and with shift we can set the focus distance and and so on so i will do that in the ipr right now 
And as you can see, we currently have no defocus. What we need to do is we have to raise those f-stop values, maybe something like two, my bad, values are too high. So, and as you can see, it already it's already starting in the foreground. And now you see it's even more the reason for using those um, very um, low values is because this object is really large and quite a lot of meters away from the camera and in reality a f-stop of two would yeah, result not in an unsharp image in, in a large amount. So that's why I dialed this values down. And here we have a much higher value. We can also um, change the focus plane on the fly with the shift button. Well, maybe we go up a bit. This should be enough. And you see it's rendering a lot, uh, quite fast, so it's working. When you have motion blur in an animation, you have to do, um, you have to basically, or you can, you don't have to, but you can change the shutter open close values. You can also use the extreme motion and, and duff uh, option. You can change the shutter and so on. But um, the most important thing on animations is that you use the so-called cache lob. The cache lob has different options. And without the cache lob, you will not see motion blur, which is based on um, primitive level. So when your animation is happening inside of a sub create, and when you not have the cache, right before or when you wrote out your USD um, with a USD ROB, like in here, you will not, um, you will not get any visible motion blur. So this is important. It needs to store those um, point position data um, from frame to frame. In the next tutorial, we will speak about additional rendering, but this is more on the PDG side, a nice addition that you can use in your day-to-day -day work. So see you in the next chapter.